going to get started with number 156 in your hymn books. Number 156, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. 156, all standing as we sing. There have been names that I have loved to hear, but never has there been a name so dear to this heart of mine as the name divine, the precious, precious name of Jesus. Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and he's just the same as his lovely name, and that's the reason why I love him so, for Jesus is the sweetest name I know. This is number 156 in our hymn books. We'll go to that last stanza. And some sweet him, see him face to face. To thank him and to face and Oh, you're all doing great. Keep going. Which he gave to me when he made me free. The blessed Son of God, oh Jesus. Please be seated. Come on up here, youngins. We're going to sing, My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. You all got that one? Whoop. Strong, mighty. Whoop, whoop, whoop. All right. You ready? You ready, Suvi? Here we go. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are His, the rivers are His, the stars are His handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do for you. One more time, little voice. You got to do this little thing here like this. What, 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 what? Everybody got it? There you go. Got your pointers? Okay. My, I got to do a little, little inside voice thing going on too. Uh, everybody got an inside voice? Okay, here we go. My God is so big. So strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are His, the rivers are His, the stars are His handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do for you. Oh, wonderful, excellent, marvelous, spectacular singing. Very good. Oh, you guys could have come up and sing with us. We needed help. No. All righty. Good morning. So nice to see you today. What a blessing it is to be here today. I got an outline for this morning's message, Sunday school, if you please. So we're taking a hiatus from some of the other series we've been doing in these last several services, talking about Bible reading and such as that. And this great portion of scripture in 2 Thessalonians, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we'll be going there. And very simple outline. And you'll notice, of course, at the top of the sheet there, that is today's date. One of those fascinating little things that happen every couple, every hundred years or so. You get a cool looking number like that. So here we are towards the end of the year. One more day left. And we're in 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you would please. I'll read a couple of verses here as we get started. And we're going to actually going to make it halfway through this outline. And I'll finish the outline, Lord willing. We'll finish next week. 
We'll make it uh, three, out of, three out of seven today. The first three points we'll be looking at this morning. And uh, uh, if you're there, 2 Timothy chapter 3, it's actually written at the top there. But uh, I'm going to start up just a few verses before that. Um, uh, Paul reminds Timothy in verse number 13 that there's going to be some evil things that go on. It says, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And that's the warning that Timothy's being uh, given from Paul. Paul, of course, has uh, sent Timothy to Ephesus. Ephesus is one of the churches that got started in Paul's ministry. And it's a very large church. And, um, of course, along with that, um, there are uh, difficulties and struggles, as he had in most of the churches that he got started. And some of the struggles he's having here is with false teachers um, that are, uh, you know, trying to influence the ministry. And so he's concerned about that. So he's writing to Timothy about um, the need to protect not only himself from false teaching, but protect the ministry and those that are a part of that ministry from, from bad teaching. There's a lot of bad teaching out there. Um, so churches need to be warned against that. Paul directs Timothy's attention towards one particular thing. And that is the word of God. He's, and he mentions in verse number 13 about evil, work, evil men and seducers. And again in verse number 14, But continue thou in the things that thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And so he's talking about um, the instructions that he's received, not only from Paul, but he even goes back further than that. Because Timothy's, um, Timothy was raised um, in, a, in a home where the Word of God was being taught, and he mentions that very specifically in verse number 15, and that from a child that has known the Holy Scriptures. Now, Timothy's mom was Jewish, his dad was Greek. Um, there may have been an a influence of Judaism in his, in his life when he was growing up. Um, doesn't say that, but it, continue, it, it talks about his mom and his grandmom, particularly with their faith in Christ. And so, I don't know how old Timothy was when folks got saved, but you please remember the fact that uh, um, you know the preaching of the gospel in the particular area where Timothy grew up at that was that was something new. So it's not something that uh, was in uh, in his in his family for generations or anything like that. This preaching of the gospel is a new thing, and so. Um, Salvation came into that household. Timothy was then being instructed in the Word of God. And so Paul brings that out from a child that has known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Our message today is in reference to the Scriptures, and it says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you. It is good to be here today. Thank you for your many blessings in this uh, end of the year, this last Sunday of the year, and um, even this New Year's uh, celebration that many will have through, uh, throughout the day and the evening. And just so thankful, Father, that uh, as, we, um, as we say goodbye to this year, we look forward uh, to another year of being able to serve you, to minister, uh, and also, Lord, a year closer to the return of your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, that we would be faithful and be about your business until Christ returns for us. Now, Lord, um, guide and direct us today in your word. Encourage us, dear Father, in this uh, wonderful task that uh, we look to, and that is um, being in uh, your word and having your word uh, be in us. And Father, for this we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. That's what we've been talking about several services now, and that is the Word of God and reading Scripture and things like that. And you can see in your outline this morning, pretty simple outline. We're just looking at these, this verse here, and I'm starting off with a really simple thing. What does all mean? All means all. I love that. This is exactly what it means. All means all. Um, it says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And, and so um, I do... Uh, have to remind uh, all of us that the whole Bible is the Word of God. It's in, in, the, it's, in, in, the, it's, in its entirety. It's everything that God would want us to have from beginning to end. Uh, there is no better book of the Bible. Uh, certainly when folks ask me, you know, what's a good place to get started at? You know, I don't normally say, well, you know, go to, you know, go, go get started in the book of Job. That'll be a really encouraging book for you to start your Christian life with. Um, but, um, 
you know, uh, so often we would, you know, encourage people that are new believers. I know myself, when I was a young Christian, I was encouraged to read the Gospel of John. I was encouraged to read the Book of Romans. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But that doesn't make those them better books than the other books. Uh, all does mean all. I, and I will say, there are some people that spend a lot of time reading um, more of a devotional type of approach to the Word of God where they're reading the Psalms and the Proverbs, and that's about all that they do. Now, so, there's nothing wrong with the Psalms and Proverbs, but that's not all the Bible, is it? And if that's where somebody spends all their time just reading Psalms and Proverbs, they're missing a whole lot of the Word of God. Um, there are other portions of Scripture, of course, that are tremendous. Of Gospels, we are introduced uh, physically to the Lord Jesus Christ and His ministry. There are some folks that get really wrapped up on, like, uh, the red letters. So I don't know if you have a red letter edition Bible. Um, I, I'm trying to think if I ever had one. I think I probably did. Probably my first Bible I ever owned was probably a red letter edition. And um, the red letter edition Bibles are simply, um, you know, the phrases, uh, things that Jesus said directly. They're put in red letters so you can read it. That doesn't... Just, just because they're, you have a red letter Bible and these are the words of Jesus doesn't make them any better than any other the words of the Bible because the Bible is given in its entirety, given by inspiration of God. And so just because Jesus spoke it, that doesn't make it something superior to something else in the Bible. And so when we consider the fact that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, we have to remember it's, it's in its entirety um, you know, there's no like best place to get started or to read or to focus your attention. It's the whole thing. Um, um, Jesus, uh, he quoted scripture um, quite often. Um, there are several places that he quotes from. Um, it's interesting because, you know, you, we, as soon as we're, we see Jesus' earthly ministry beginning and he gets led into the wilderness and he's tempted by the devil and uh, the devil's, you know, here's, here's a stone, turn it into bread. You've been fasting for 40 days. Get yourself something to eat. And he quotes, of course, um, 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 uh, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And that's a quote from what book of the Bible? But I know it. But uh, you know, <laughs> do you know? Dude, it's a quote from Deuteronomy. It's, it's from Deuteronomy. Matter of fact, the three, the three temptations that he receives and, uh, you know, um, his, his response to that all come from the book of Deuteronomy. I'm just reading that verse I'm from Deuteronomy chapter 8. It says, he humbled, uh, he humbled thee, he suffered thee to hunger, he fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not, neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And that's, a Deut that's Deuteronomy chapter 8. Uh, I think the other two references are Deuteronomy chapter 6, um, where, uh, you know, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And, and so this is um, just a reminder. This, I mean, Deuteronomy is not, so, often is not on the top of folks' list. Well, oh, this is like the greatest book of the Bible. Uh, I'm going to read the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, I mean, the book of Deuteronomy is a great book, um, but it's not, uh, it's not one of those books that people just love to read. Um, but yet Jesus Christ, in the midst of the temptations that he received at the beginning of his ministry, went right to the book of Deuteronomy to quote in order to fight against the temptations of the devil. I mean, that just that should tell you something. And, and so when we, we, um, when we look at the Word of God, we look at it as, um, as a complete package. It's everything that God wants us to know. There's nothing missing. I was mentioning last week, we were talking about, you know, the reading of the scriptures. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, we had that quote of scripture uh, in reference to a book uh, written to the, to the uh, church of Laodicea. Uh, you know, we don't have that epistle. And that doesn't mean that someone failed. You know, some scribe somewhere in the first century is like, oh, what did I do with that? Yeah, I forgot, I for, you know, I lost, I lost the epistle to the Laodiceans. Um, so I'm, I, don't, I don't sweat over that. I don't feel like I've missed anything. I believe that God was instrumental in making sure that everything that I need is in this book. And this book in its entirety is all that I need. 
So when we talk about Scripture, all Scripture, uh, Paul is making mention to Timothy in reference to the Old Testament primarily, because the New Testament is being written. Um, but uh, as those books are being completed, inspired by God, and being included in, this, uh, in what we have as our Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, I look at it and say, and make that same statement, all of this that I have right here is the inspired Word of God, and everything that I need is right here. So all does mean all, not just little bits and pieces, not, you know, is there something missing somewhere? Uh, it is everything that God has for me, and it's, I find it uh, in this book. So all certainly means all. The next word, of course, inspired. Inspiration means all, give, all Scripture is given by inspiration. Inspiration means God breathed. That's what the, literally what the word means. It means God breathed. It's not just, it's not just inspirational words. You can read things that are inspiring, they encourage you. They kind of get your attention. I've read a lot. Uh, you know, my, my the style of reading that I do, I, uh, all kinds of different genre that I enjoy reading. I like poetry. I do like, um, you know, reading mostly nonfiction, but there's some great fiction books that I've read uh, that are very inspiring. Um, there's some books that I've read that uh, just kind of shake you a little bit, get your attention with some things. I um, always enjoy getting, uh, you know, people give me books and say, hey, I've read this. It's a great book. You ought to read it. And uh, uh, several, there are several books that I've read uh, that have been suggested by others that have just kind of really gotten a hold of me. Um, and it was, uh, um, you know, in, inspirationally, um, you know, and I hate to use the word self-help books, but there's some, been some really good ones over the years that have kind of drawn my attention more to my own fallacies as far as you know, time management or how I handle my daily activities. And those, those, those have been a big help. I don't, I, don't put a, I don't invest a lot of stuff of mental capacity into self-help books, but there's always been a few. And, they're, and, and if, if they're, if they're Bible-based, they're even more, if you would, inspirational. They encourage me, especially encourage me towards the things of God. Um, but, you know, the Bible is not just in, inspirational. There's a difference between something being inspirational, encouraging, thought-provoking, motivating. There's a, there's a difference between that and the inspired Word of God. In, the inspired means that it is actually given by God. These are God's words. Um, we're reminded, I'm, I'm, just, I'm reading from 2 Peter Chapter 1, if you'd like to turn over there, it's not too far from where you're at right now, but here in 2 Peter chapter 1, it says this, uh, and of course, um, uh, Peter is, uh, is writing, and 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse number 16, he says, We have not followed cunningly devised fables. I like that. That's just a nice way of saying fairy tales, you know, um, things that have been written to, you know, kind of get your attention. I was, um, I was reading, all right, um, matter of fact, just, matter of, just last week here at the church, somebody was asking me questions about the Apocrypha. Um, if you're not familiar with the Apocrypha, um, uh, Roman Catholics have, between the Old Testament and New Testament, they have uh, several books of the, uh, that they at, include in their Bible called the Apocrypha. Things like First and Second Maccabees are in there. I was, um, there are several other books. There's the Book of Wisdom, the Book of Susanna, uh, and then there's, then there's Bell and the Dragon. Bell and the Dragon. It's a very interesting story. It's a very well cunningly devised fable. I mean, it's an interesting story. Um, Bell and the Dragon uh, is a uh, two different stories that are accumulated together during the days that, of the Babylonian captivity. Daniel is in uh, in Babylon, and uh, it's a, one of the stories is a story about how the um, uh, how the the false um, the false worship of the gods there. Um, King Nebuchadnezzar is convinced that there, there is real gods, um, in, the Babylonians worship real gods, because every night, this, this is how Bell and the Dragon is, every night they go in and they put food on an altar 
inside of Bel. Bel is one of the, one of the um, uh, Babylonian gods. They put food inside on an altar inside of this chamber where Bel um, statue is. And then they shut and lock the door every night. And Nebuchadnezzar comes in and he says, we, un- we open the door in the morning and the food is gone. So we know that, we know that Bel is real because he consumes the food at night. And this is the bell and dragon. This is how the, if that apocryphal book goes. They, um, they, Daniel says, give me, just give me a minute here. And uh, one day he goes and gets ashes and sprinkles ashes all over the floor. After they put the food up there, the door is locked. The next morning, Nebuchadnezzar comes in. They open the door up and the food is all gone. And he's like, what's? And he sees these footprints. <laughs> all right. And they, they lead to this like secret passageway, you know, and he calls in all the priests. He's like, what's the deal? And they've been stealing the food at night and feeding their families with it. All right. So, I mean, that sounds, that's, Bell, that's part of the fairy tales of Bell and the Dragon. But the, the, okay, this is the worst part. And uh, because it's, it's a multiple stories because Bell and the Dragon, the dragon um, has to do with the fact of, of Daniel not worshiping another one of the gods and this kind of makes sound familiar. Um, and then because of that, they're going to throw him in the lion's den. And as you read through that section of the story, what happens is it really contradicts a lot of what the book of Daniel says about why Daniel was thrown in the lion's den. And so you look at that and you go, okay, well now one of these stories is not right. It's either the Bible or this cunningly devised fable. But here they have it in their Bible, Roman Catholics hold to the Apocrypha, they hold, have it in their Bible as an inspired book. So that, that, now there's a problem, because <laughs> you have scripture that's, uh, according to them, both of them would be considered scripture, and they're in contradiction to one another about attitudes, about why Daniel was thrown in the lion's den, about what happened in particular. And, and so, um, you know, when I read 1 Peter, and, or excuse me, 2 Peter, and it talks about, you know, we've not believed cunningly devised fables. There's a lot of people who believe cunningly devised fables in reference to God and in reference to their faith. And, and matter of fact, sometimes they're, they're more inclined to believe fables than they are to believe the Word of God. I, this book is given by inspiration of God. This is God's words. These are not fables. These are not some things that somebody conceived and thought, man, this, this is going to encourage people, you know, a thousand years from now. I think I'll write this down. And maybe they'll, maybe they'll preserve it in a book somewhere. That's, that's not it. And so, um, so Peter makes this, this statement, we have not followed cunningly devised fables, which... Um, uh, when we made known unto you the power of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty, and we received from God the Father honor and glory, when he, talking about Jesus, received from God the Father honor and glory, when we, were, uh, when we came, um, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. He's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration when he was up there, and, and you know, Peter, James, and John, and, the, you know, they're, my beloved son, and, and Peter's like, oh, look at this, you know. And there's you know, Moses and Elijah, and he's all excited about it. And um, he says in verse number 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn, until the day star arise, in your hearts. And so he's talking about the Word of God. He's talking about its superiority. It's, he's talking about the fact that you know, we didn't make this stuff up. These aren't just stories we wrote. This is, this is what happened. This is truth. These are things that God said. And, um, and this, is, this is our approach to the Word of God. It is God breathed. And, and so he goes on. Verse number 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophets came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved 
by the Holy Ghost. And this is our understanding of what this book is. It is the work of the Holy Ghost. It's, it's not just cleverly written things. It's not just inspirational stories. It is what God wanted us to hear. It's, it's directional. Uh, in other words, God, God gave it very specifically to us. It's intentional. In other, so that means that God has planned what needed to be said and how it needed to be transmitted. And uh, it is, it's personal. Um, so it's, it's not just a story about something else that you can read and say, oh, I can you know, make some application for myself. You know, it's not like reading you know, Iliad and Odyssey and going, oh, I can make a, this a great storyline. I'm sure there's some good moral lessons to be found here. This is personal when he starts talking to us and he starts talking to you and he deals with you about your life and your sin and your struggles. And, and then this is the intent of God's word. It is a personal book. It has purpose to it. Um, that God has intention found in his book. He's written it. He's extended it for a reason. And, and, and it, of course, then it comes right down to it. It's reliable. If it's God-breathed, it's God's word, and it has to be reliable. It's without fault. Uh, it's given to us. Um, it's not something we had to figure out. Uh, God's desire is always to communicate, is always to get um, uh, things to us. It's not, it's not like some hidden book somewhere that somebody found in some, you know, some dusty cave somewhere and you know, blew off the dust and said, oh my, look at this. Uh, you know, we, and they built a religion around it. It's, it's not that at all. It is God purposefully extending truth to us to expose not only himself and his character, but what we really are and to give us an opportunity of building a relationship with him based on the information that he's given to us about himself. And um, it is, yeah, we, can, we can trust every word of it. It's, it's just glorious. Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 1 starts by saying this, God who at, sun, at, um, uh, who at sundry times in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir for all things, um, um, heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And so this is, um, it's, it's purposeful. God has spoken, and he's spoken to us by his Son, um, and he has given to us uh, everything that we need. I want you to direct your attention to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Here in Romans chapter 3, I'll start at the beginning of the chapter. It says, What advantage then hath the Jews? What profit is there of circumcision? Now, he's, he's uh, the first couple of chapters of the book of Romans is all about um, uh, presenting the reality of the sinfulness of all of mankind. And so, you know, Paul's going to present, you know, the religious folks, the Jews. He's going to talk about Gentiles who have never been exposed to the Word of God. He's going to talk about people that are kind of religious. He, he's he's going to, you know, talk about everybody. He's going to cover the whole thing. It's like nobody's off the hook here. And, he, and he, of course, he makes those, those bold statements uh, towards the end of, the, of these opening chapters of Romans that, you know, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, you know, um, he's, he's got to talk about the fact that these religious people, the Jews, uh, and they have the, he's talking about circumcision. That's a, that's a ritual that God gave to them. As a, as a token of the covenant relationship that he had with the Jewish people. And you think, well, man, they've, they've just got to, they've got to be it. You know, they're, they're God's people. And, he, and he's talking about what, what is the advantage there? And he, he mentions this much in every way. He said, chiefly, because that unto them was committed the oracles of God. That word oracles means exposed truth. It's talking about the Word of God, the Bible. So what he's mentioning is, is that, you know, all the rest of the world certainly is responsible to God. 
But God chose the, the Jewish people and God began to reveal truth to them. So there's a great advantage there of having the word of God um, relayed to you. But he goes on. For what if some do, uh, did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, and it starts here. Now, what he's, what he's talking about now is the fact that there are people that, have, that are exposed to truth who don't believe in truth. They have the word of God, and they don't, they don't get it. They don't, they don't take it in. Um, I, I, I suppose the best way to, to kind of paint the picture here is if, let's just say, you know, you're, um, so, some, there's a Christian home. There's mom and dad. They've been saved a long time, have faith in Jesus Christ. They have children that are born in that household. And those children, are, is there an advantage for those children? Okay. Certainly, um, they are raised in a home where God is feared, where the word of God is presented, where folks are believers, they go to church, they hear the preaching of God's word on a regular basis, they're always exposed to biblical teaching. Uh, there are, you know, uh, he's talking about circumcision, which is, a, you know, kind of, a, you know, that, uh, that um, if you would, an ordinance that the Jews would practice. But just think about this, think about all the... Um, um, regulations that would be in a household. In other words, the parents have been taught the Word of God. My, this is how I'm going to raise my kids. This is what we're going to do. This is what we're not going to do. This is how we're going to live. We're going to go to church on Sunday. We're going to, there's certain things we're, going to li- we're, we're not going to allow in the household. So they're putting a lot of things in place that are good. There's nothing wrong with it. But does that mean that everyone is going to believe? And so he's talking about the fact that there's an advantage there, but the reality of it is, is that even with all the advantages, there still has to be faith. That ingredient is not something that's just automatic. Everybody believes because, you know, I'm a Christian. My kids are born in a Christian home. That makes them all Christians. That doesn't work that way. Is there an advantage? Oh, yes, but there's no guarantee. And so here we have this presentation starting here. And I, I, I end it there in verse, was that verse number four? As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our righteousness um, um, commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who hath uh, who taketh vengeance? I, I speak as a man. God forbid. For when he, um, for then, how shall God judge the world? And, and so we we have this um, beginning of this uh, this conversation about judging. God is going to deal with the sinfulness of mankind, and it's because of their lack of response to the word of God. You know, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. God gave his word. And it's to the advantage of the Jews, but not, not, everyone, not everyone believed it. He, he's going to go on. He's going to talk about his, his judging of all mankind. And it, it's not because God's word wasn't there. It's not because God was deficient in getting truth to people. God's desire is that his word infiltrates everyone's life and that people respond to it. It is it's our responsibility to make sure that folks hear and respond to the word of God because it is God's word. Um, that last point uh, that I'm going to deal with today, we're going to talk about those last four, doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. My goal is uh, next Sunday uh, for Sunday school to talk about those four three those four things, but the word profitable is used here. What does the word profitable mean? The word profitable simply means usefulness. Usefulness. It's a very interesting word. Matter of fact, I was I, I have I have some favorite 
um, lexicons. A lexicon is just a dictionary in a different language. So it's, of course, it's a Greek word that was used there. And I was just, I was looking that word up the other day. I had my favorite Greek lexicon back in my office there. And I'm just flipping and I'm flipping and I'm flipping. And I, it's the, it's actually the last definition in, in the Greek lexicon. I mean, that, what a distinction that is, you know, uh, to be the last diction, the last definition in, in the lexicon. Um, but that's what, that's really simply what it means. It means, it means usefulness. Um, the other definitions that my lexicon gave me were it's advantageous um, and uh, what, uh, what is particularly helpful. So all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's advantageous. It is useful. It is something that you can use. So think about this a second. Uh, maybe in your kitchen, there's a particular advice, uh, a, a device that you use all the time. When, when our kids were younger and um, uh, we had this um, particular spatula. No, we didn't use it to whoop the kids. No, 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 no. We had this particular spatula that we used all the time. Do you guys remember what it was called? The whipper flipper. The whipper flipper. Yes, we had the whipper flipper. And uh, it was a tremendous kind of angular shape that had slat, yeah, had slats in it and stuff. And it was just the perfect tool. We used it. You could stir with it. You could flip pancakes with it. You could do all kinds of stuff. Joyce used it all the time, the whipper flipper, okay? I don't know if that was its official name, but it worked for me, okay? And so... Um, that was a very useful tool. Anybody have a Leatherman? Does anybody own a Leatherman? Any Leatherman owners? My granddaughter owns a Leatherman. It's his, but you use it. Amen. That is the cool. I have a, I have a super Leatherman, the, the larger size one that I use a lot. I use that thing all the time. My, it's, a, it's a utility knife. That has all, it's like, you know, you know, with like a Swiss Army knife? Yeah. Okay, well, this is better than the Swiss Army knife. Okay, this has everything on. My old one, my old Leatherman that I actually, it, I wore it out. It's hard to wear out a Leatherman, but I wore this one out. And my son Buzz said, hey, you, they'll fix it for you. So I mailed it in and it broke my heart because they sent me a brand new one. Okay, and you're thinking, wow, what a deal. Okay, now this old Leatherman, all right. I gutted deers with it. I rewired my house with it. I fixed the car with it. I sawed down a Christmas tree one year with it. Okay, this is all. This is my Leatherman. Okay, and um, it, so many other things that I've done with this Leatherman over the years. And and so when they this, when they told me they were going to mail me a new one, I'm thinking all these memories are wrapped up in this Leatherman because I had done so many different things with it. It was, it was the most useful tool that I've ever owned in my entire life, okay? So if, you, if you're thinking, you know, what are you going to get somebody for Christmas? Get them a Leatherman. They will, they will cherish that the rest of their lives, all right? But um, that word, when I look at this word and it's talking about profitable, it's not talking about profitable as in money, it's not talking about profitable like in it's going to be, you know, look what I got, you know. It has to do with saying this is going to be the most useful thing that I'm ever going to have in my entire life. And it's the Word of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It is the most useful thing that will ever be a part of your life. You, you'll you kind of like my Leatherman. Okay, I mean, if, if you can use the same tool to gut a deer as you can to cut down a Christmas tree or, or do the wiring in your house, you think to yourself, this is useful for everything, everything. And that means I can look at the Word of God and I say, you know, this is useful, not just for religious purposes. It, it just doesn't help us to have a church service proper. Um, it's going to help me with my marriage. It's going to help me with raising my children. It's going to help me with my finances. It's going to help me with every personal relationship I have with others. It's going to help me to overcome difficulties in my life and struggles. It's going to give me encouragement when things are really dark. 
It is going to give me something to rejoice about every single day. I mean, and let's, over top of all that, it introduced me to Jesus Christ, which transformed my life forever. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty good book. <laughs> I got some favorite books in my library. And uh, there's some I read, you know, I, I read just about every, either every year or every other year. I like to read them because they're encouraging and they're helpful. Um, but you know, there is n- absolutely nothing in my library that even comes close to being what this book is. It is profitable. It changed everything in my life. Um, I'm reading from 1 Timothy chapter 4. The Bible says, Bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having a promise of life that now is and of that which is to come. And, you know, living a godly life is, is not something that you just decide to do. It's, it's something that is exposed in the Word of God. This is what God requires of me. And, and if, I'm, if, I, if I read God's Word and I apply the principles of God's Word and I'm living a godly life, I know that there will be a promise of life that now is. It's going to change my life the way it is now, but it's going to have an impact on things to come. There's, there's future benefit for it that you cannot get anywhere else. Um, this is, uh, I'm reading, this is Titus chapter 3, verse number 8. It says, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that, um, that they which have believed God, um, excuse me, believed in God, might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. I'm going to be talking about good works uh, during our um, afternoon service. Um, and you know, when, when God, ex- from his word, exposes to us the things that we ought to be doing, the things that we ought to be involved in, the work that God has given us to do, um, there's a great benefit to that. It profits not only us, but it profits other people. Um, it is a great blessing to be involved in the ministry, to do things for, for, uh, for the work of, uh, do the work of God. But you know, what we are doing for God is, are things that God has, is showing us in His Word. This is, God is giving us His Word, saying this is, this is going to transform your life, but it's also going to engage you in this work to come. I do want to direct you back to the, the verse we got started in here in 2 Timothy, because it says this, and this is what we'll continue on with uh, for the morning service and, and then the afternoon, because it says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. The end game here is for, as a believer, is for our work for Christ, our labor for Christ, what we're doing for Christ. And so we're being exposed to the Word of God. We're reading the Word of God. We're letting the Word of God dwell in us richly. It's becoming a part of our life because God has something for you to do. And the more that we're exposed to the Word of God, the more that we're entrenched in this book, the more that we understand what God's will is for our lives. And and God has a plan for you. He's got some things He's designed very specifically for you to be involved in. And He is preparing you and equipping you for that by giving you His Word, the Word of God. Lord bless you. Thanks for being in Sunday School. Next week, Lord willing, doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll be dismissed. Father, thank you, Lord. It's been good to be in Sunday school this morning. I do pray that you would continue to encourage us um, in the work that you've given us to do. And Lord, that that would come through your precious word day after day. Thank you for this Lord's Day that we can spend the time together focusing on your word and on your son, Jesus. I do pray you'd bless us throughout the day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lord bless you. Thanks for being in Sunday school today.